good. You're awesome in this place. Oh, Father, you are worthy of all praise. To you, my life, I raise. You are awesome in this place. Mighty God, you are awesome in this place. Mighty God, oh yes you are. You are awesome in this place. Oh, Father, you are worthy of my. Mighty God, you are awesome in my life, <laughs> mighty God, oh yes he is, you are awesome in my life, oh my Father. My family, mighty God, oh yes you are, you are awesome in my family, oh the Father, you are worthy of all praise, to you my life I raise, you are awesome in my family, mighty God. You are awesome in my finances, <laughs> mighty God. Oh, yes, you are. You are awesome in my finances, oh, oh my Father. As I was sitting there, and it was coming on pretty strong, he said, listen for the sound of rain. Can you hear it? And I said, God, I want to hear it. He said, listen for the sound of rain. What position will you be in? Will you be as Elisha who was on his face crying out for the rain? Or will you be the servant constantly running around trying to find it? Because it will come face down. It will come through your cries. It will come through your repentance. It will come when you as the church are back on your face before him. And he said, the sound is already close. He said, you can smell it. You can hear it. You can feel it. Look and listen. It's going to rain. He said, but I don't see it. Yeah, he said, I came back, but I don't see it. Go look again, church. But I still don't see it. Go look again. There is a sound, and it's raining. 
If it's just in me, it's rainy. <laughs> but I've been telling people revival begins in me. But I don't believe I'm the only one it's raining in. I believe there is a remnant of God's people that they are beginning to feel, smell, and understand the presence of rain. And they are also beginning to realize it's right here. You just want to keep telling people it's right here, but they're not quite getting it. It's like, don't you smell it? Don't you feel it? You know, those little misties that you feel, and you go outside and you said, is that rain or, or did somebody just kind of, you know, when you kind of spit talk? <laughs> God just spit on us a little bit? <laughs> he can if he wants to because he's so anointed. Amen. And sometimes it'll just, you'll just get somewhere and you'll just feel like this mist. And it's like, wow, it's pretty strong here tonight. He's here. He's here. You don't need to bypass what he wants to do, what he's up to. He is already here. Many times we're trying to work it up. What are you doing? We just want him here. <laughs> well, he's already here. You know, many times we say, welcome, Holy Spirit, but I'm saying stay. Please stay. Don't go. We need you, Holy Spirit. And we thank you. We thank you for these hungry people that have come out tonight. You wouldn't be here if you were not hungry for more of him. You wouldn't be here if you was not hungry for the presence of God. You wouldn't be here if you were not hungry for revival. So look at your neighbor and say, thank you for being hungry. Because there's some people I want to go to churches and force feed them because they're not hungry. And when a person's not hungry, you can't make them hungry. And I've said that before. Moses and Joshua and Caleb, they had to wait on the promised land because the people weren't ready to go in. But I told God, I don't think I can wait on the people. I'm ready. So I'll just force feed them if you'll let me. <laughs> so we can go ahead and have revival. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Thank you. So wherever I go, I change the atmosphere. Look at your neighbor and say, wherever I go, I change the atmosphere. You're supposed to be an atmosphere changer because you're carrying his presence and his glory. Amen. If you're just carrying it on Sunday as the second Adam on Sunday and the first Adam on Monday, you're not changing nothing, not even yourself. Oh, well, and out meddling instead of preaching, huh? Amen. Do want you to know we have some great impartation materials back there on our table. This helps to keep us on the road. We go to Colombia, we go to Africa, uh, and we travel the United States. I don't know where else all he will have us go, but I'm ready, willing to go. And if I hear about revival, I mean, I was trying to get to Argentina <laughs> when I heard they had revival, and they're like, what are you going there for? So they're having a revival. When I hear about revival, it's like, well, where's the jet plane? <laughs> Give me a way to get there. I want to be right smack dab in the middle of it. People say, no, you'll be the one with carrying revival. I, well, right now, even as a carrier of revival, I just want to go sit right down in the middle of it. Because his presence, his glory, his, his fire, it's all exciting. And it's life-changing. And it's so awesome to watch what he does in people's lives. In fact, I just got a couple of texts today just from meetings we've just been in. Uh, a lady whose shoulders, she said, they have, have, my shoulders are great. They haven't hurt. I think this was over a week, maybe two weeks ago. Prayed for her, and she said, they still haven't, the pain hasn't come back. It's still healed. And then another text I got just right before we came into service uh, from By His Grace Ministries, Donna Peacher, she said, the lady you prayed for that had the tumors and um, something else, I forget. There was some, uh, some, her tumors and something else. Anyway, she's gone to the doctor. Oh, and they said they were cancerous. Yes, and she was really concerned. And I remember even when I hugged her and was praying for her because I thought, what a, I thought, God, you got to heal the inside. There's more than just sickness in the body. This woman is in pain, and I'm not talking about pain of the physical. She was, but I could see the little girl all broken and messed up, the teenage girl. And even when she just tried to talk to you, she couldn't even hold her head up. There was just such defeat in her. And God, that the doctor said there is no cancer, and those things are shrinking, and they don't understand. 
They hadn't even done chemo or nothing. Wow. Because even when I prayed for her for that to happen, I said, let this be a sign that she is special and that you want to heal her from a little girl up. And she just wept and cried on my shoulder and my arms. And she said, and I don't remember I said it as I had my hands, I guess, where the tumors was. She said, I said, they're shrinking right now. I, okay, if I did, it's because he said it. Amen. Hallelujah. So just to let you know that we do have my dad, he told you, was Jack Coe. who had the largest tent in the world. Held 22,000 people with another 10 to 20,000 people standing outside. It was fire of revival. I said, it was fire of revival. People weren't just coming there because there was a concert. They weren't coming there because it felt good or they were good motivational speakers. Today we got some great motivational speakers that will draw a crowd and they can motivate you for a few hours. In other words, I've been in the business world where they had motivational speakers and they brought them in for corporations and you might get motivated and pumped up for a week or a few hours, but when you got back into your routine, you couldn't sustain it. But with the Holy Ghost, you will sustain what the Holy Ghost begins to do in the fire and the teaching he puts in us, amen. And so that's what a lot of that was back there. And it was great teaching, uh, great revival, fire, many, many, many signs and wonders and miracles, the supernatural. As I've said it before, a woman dead on a cot, and they said, Brother Cole, that lady you prayed for is dead. He said, where is she? He threw the sheet back, picked her up, threw her in the air, and said, I said, live in Jesus' name. And when she hit the platform, she spun like a top and came back to life. Amen. That's what God does. He would jerk them out. He took one and he jerked out of a wheelchair and kicked the wheelchair so they couldn't sit back down in it. Man hit the floor and he picked him back up and he said, I said, walk in Jesus' name. And he hit the floor again and he picked him up again. I said, walk in Jesus' name. And he hit the floor again and this time he picked him up, turned him around and kicked him. And it looked like he was going to hit the floor again and instead the Holy Ghost hit him and he ran all over that tent. Woo! What did that? Fire. <laughs> the presence of revival. Many, many miracles happening. I could sit here and tell you stories all night of his and stories of us because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you want to know about who this was, an alcoholic, got locked up in nine different nut wards in the army for serving God, thought he was crazy, and ended up at the largest tent in the world with divine miracles, salvations, deliverance of people. He wrote his own story called the Jack Coe story. Amen. And they called it back then the ABCs of revival, A.A. A. Allen, William Branham, and Jack Coe. Some of you say, I've never heard of them. Catherine Kuhlman, Oral Roberts. Oh, yeah, now I've heard of that. All of them was in this time of that fire of revival. And they called it the ABCs of revival. A.A. A. Allen, William Branham, Jack Coe. And we have the book of A.A. A. Allen's called The Price of God's Miracle Power. Many people come up and say, I want that anointing of your dad's. And I say, really? You want to pay the price? The price of God's miracle power. And he writes the book about it, and there is a price. People who come to you, Pastor Mike, say, I want that anointing you got. You want to pay the price? He can tell you some stories of some price he paid. He's got some glorious stories, too, of the faith walk, but there's some stories that there was a price that was put behind it. And if you want to know more about that price and that cost, that's a great book. Curing the Incurable, my dad wrote this book also when he was alive. It's a great book. He had people who had sclerodermis and other incurable diseases that were healed. Doctors scratching their head and sending documents wanting to know how it happened every year to those people. How did you get healed? Because this is an incurable disease. And they would send back J-E-S-U-S. <laughs> they, they had a questionnaire trying to figure it out. They just wanted to have the document so they could help others. And they want, amen, it's Jesus. Hallelujah. Bandanas, we do pray over them. We have, but we'll do special prayer. We use these, we tell people for prayer cloths. We also have prayer cloths if you want a prayer cloth. But if you want to give somebody something that you feel like that they would not receive a prayer cloth from you, and yet, we have prayed over it, or we'll say a special prayer. 
Uh, I've told it before, but I'll tell it again. There was a mother who got one for her son who was not saved, and she gave it to him. He rode motorcycles, and one day he came in and threw that thing. I said, I'm so miserable. I don't know what's wrong with me. And they talked for some time. He began weeping, gave his heart to the Lord, and she said, it's the bandana. We prayed over it so you'd get saved. It wasn't the bandana. It was his presence. And the Lord wants us to take this anointing that's in the house out there. He don't want you to keep it to yourself in here, church. He wants you to take it to the people. Cards with DVDs, their baby, wedding, birthday. They got the themes with them. Beautiful scriptures. These are very anointed, and these are very good. I already sold four tonight before church. She felt the anointing on it. I was like, praise God, bless her, Lord. We have CDs and DVDs. My favorite of my dad's is God will set your fields on fire. And that's a very powerful message. If you haven't heard, how many's already got it and listened to this one? Uh, will it make you kind of get it on your face before God? It surely, when a man told me he, huh, you what? Before you're done listening to it, you're on your face. I know it by heart, and I still get on my face before God. David Wilkerson said this is one of the most powerful sermons he ever heard, and it is. It's very powerful. Man asked me to put a warning label on it. I said, a warning label? He said, yes, warn them not to listen to it in their car. I said, why? That's why most people get CDs. Not that one. Not that one. I said, why? He said, because I had to get in the floorboard four times and cry out to God. So you've been warned. There's no warning label. Amen. You want the testimony of my dad, a brand new name? This is him telling his own testimony, how he hot dog God. It's a powerful message about people getting saved and hot dog God. And this is powerful, powerful. Overflow, this is where I believe we should be in the church. This I preached, and my husband told me I needed to put it on the table. And, and so here it is. If you don't like it, take it up with him. But I believe that's where we're supposed to be, not just coming to church and just getting enough. I believe we're supposed to be in overflow and excess, a fire down in our soul we can't contain, we can't control. And this is talking about that and how he fills our cup to overflow so we can splash on others. Yay. Amen. Freely receive, freely you give. Arise, take up your bed and walk. Uh, there's a lady that every time she comes, probably when she comes to the women conference, she bought several of these because she said, I had to go in and I listened to that story about the man in the white suit and wept and cried and wept and cried that you told. And she said, I just have to get more. And she started passing them out to her friends. So I tell a lot of healing testimonies as well as what Jesus is saying, arise, take up your bed and walk. And so it's got a lot of faith building in there. Bracelets for the get from the foreign countries, please don't untie them they pull apart and you put, pull them back together just like that okay amen well if i can get a hold of the ends there you go and of course bracelets with scriptures so if you've been trying to learn and memorize scriptures buy you a bracelet with one on it and you can just sit there in between your breaks at work and say for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever there's other ones philippians 3 14 and other so these are great scripture bracelets that you can give cds with music and it's a uh, alabaster box i can only imagine uh, sweet by and by it is no secret there's many more and my favorite I have to tell you about I saw two guys coming in with them on tonight the disciple crosses and they got the same color I picked the red white and blue so make America great again amen <laughs> it's time we honor our country and love our country I love America I said I love America if you go to some of these foreign countries with me and you get back you'll be like I love you, America. Amen. So if you don't love America, let me take you on a few trips. You'll be coming back in love with America. Amen. And so we have them in all different colors. Red, white, and blue is the one I picked. They're all ages, all sizes, big or small. And they're great because if somebody comes up and says, I like your necklace, you can witness to them. You say, let me tell you the story. Take it off and say, this is the whip they beat Jesus with. You already got their attention now. <laughs> and this represents the crown of thorns that went around his head, and these are the spikes that went into his feet and his hands for you, that you may be saved, healed, and delivered. 
and then you just begin to tell them whatever they need prayer or whatever you the Lord lays upon or they tell you then you're able to witness to them and tell them about the Lord amen amen y'all go to sleep huh are you excited you're smelling rain you're looking for rain you believe in the rain I know I do I'm gonna have revival with or without you let me say that again. I'm going to have revival with, which I hope is with you, or without you. Amen. Honey, you got something? Come on up. I want you all to meet my husband. He will help me pray. Are you all in a hurry tonight? I hope not. If you are, then you can sneak out in here in a little bit. And or we'll give you a break to... Oh, we're going to lock the door. <laughs> Well, if we could do that, we'll just fill them up like the woman did with a little bit of oil. Yeah. Put... Going to force <laughs> Bunch of crazy people show up on a Thursday night at church. What's wrong with y'all? What? That sounds good. Anybody drive through some rain coming in? There's one. I don't know about y'all. There's two. I don't know about y'all, but I, I tell you what, when I walked in the door, I felt rain in here. Come on. I still do. Isn't it good? It's good. I don't know why we're on rain so much tonight, but there's something to it. I don't know. Uh, uh, there's so many people that you hear talk about the coming revival, and I believe that this coming revival is going to be the greatest thing we've ever seen. And I still believe that we're going to, a lot of us are going to see it and be involved in it. Pastor Mike was saying the same thing a while ago. He, he, it's basically the same thing. That, that, that thing shows up. The Holy Spirit's going to show up with it. Come on. And it is going to be wonderful, but it's going to shake people up. I guarantee you, it's going to shake people up. Some people are not going to be prepared for this. And, and I, 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 I'm not trying to scare anybody. There's not nothing to be scared of. If you're saved and sanctified, filled the Holy Spirit, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Okay? However, if you're not, we probably need to talk. Amen? So I think it's, uh, uh, what's coming is fabulous. It's great. It's going to change the face of the earth. Because it's not going to be in the United States, kids. It's going to be all over. Right? So it's going to change the face of the earth. I want to be involved in it, don't you? Hallelujah. I want to be there. So I just kind of want you to have that in the back of your mind to, 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 to be thinking about that. Uh, uh, you know, it's just simple things like, you know, when it happens, people are going to start just fogging into the church the parking lots are going to have to be expanded people are going to come in and gripe to the pastor they took my parking place they took my seat and the pastor's going to look at them and said don't don't look at me that did mine too that kind of stuff's going to happen i mean it's just simple things you know you think that that, that, that we're going to have to do. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to do some things. And I'll tell you another thing. Everybody's going to be working. One man, one woman can't handle what's fixing to happen. It's all hands on deck. How many, anybody in the Navy besides me and Pastor Mike? Well, remember when we heard all hands on deck? Man, you were hooking them. <laughs> you were ready. And that's what's going to happen when this comes. I think the Lord's going to see all hands on deck, and it's going to be a great time. Amen? If you love him, say amen. Now put your hands together and give Jesus a big round of applause. Hallelujah. Whoo. <laughs> Whoo, I'm stirred. I've been stirred. I've been studying some more on revival and talking about things of revival you know, I first was looking to do something else, and I just kept being drawn back to revival, drawn back to it. And I said, God, I came in here the other night, 
and I had left a service and it was getting close to 10 o'clock at night or 9.45, which I'm not, a lot of times this place is shut down by then. Not always, but there's times some glory falls in here and you're like, okay, so I saw the lights on and I heard talking. I thought, woo, they're still in church. So I snuck on around in here and back here in the back was a little group all gathered around talking about revival because there's some people so hungry for it. And as I began to realize the different things we talked about and, and he made a comment which really stirred me because that's the same thing. I preached it before years ago, but it's been a long time. But he made a comment and that's been my comment. I don't want this next fire to go out. If God begins to get the revival fire going, I don't want it to go out. Amen. And man can get in the way and cause the revival to stop. There are many things, and at some point, maybe during this time, I've been studying some of the things. I've been studying some of the histories of what caused the, the, the loss of the fire, what happened. Also, just looking how there was such a sovereign move of God and how it, 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 it lifted different things that, that created from it. And, and it could be that it wasn't because people didn't do, but there was things I did look at they didn't do that stopped, and later the revival stopped. Sometimes he may just lift it. I really don't know. But I know that he wants us to be on fire. I know he said either you'd be hot or cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out. So I know God wants his church hot. I know God wants his church on fire. And if the book of Acts is the first fruit, it was a plan from the beginning for a fire to cover the world because he said, I'm not willing any should perish, but all come to repentance. I said, he said, I'm not willing any. So that means if the fires would have kept going, it would have consumed people who was in sin, who would have repented and cried out to God because revival is repentance what revival is it's repentance and the deeper the cry of repentance the stronger the revival fires are amen and because when people begin to get comfortable complacent and they say i have need for nothing most people today because we can find everything at our fingertips and we're like we're okay we're not in need for nothing and so it's like unless there's just something desperate then we cry out to god then other than that it's like well i'm comfortable i'm okay and the church got in a very comfortable position and a very comfortable place so we're going to address some of these things. It's going to be some teaching. Yeah, I love to jump, jump up here and romp and stomp and carry on. And I love fire, and it may turn into that. But there's just some things that he was teaching me that I want to help teach you and that we want to work together at, right? But one of the things I want to involve you, you need to be involved in this. As he said, all hands on deck. But I think some people don't fully have a, a, an idea or a conception or maybe they don't really realize what revival really is. You know, revival is a meeting or series of meetings is what Webster says. A, a meeting or series of meetings for the purpose of reawakening religious faith. So that means that something was alive that died or went to sleep. And he wants to restore those fires, rekindle that in us to bring us back to that place in him. What did he say to the Laodicean church? Return to your first love. He wants us to be in love. Passionately. Burning with love. You know, your spouses would like that too. They want you to be passionately burning in love, but we let things get in the way and our love begins to die down and we begin to take advantage of each other and pretty soon it's like ice water thrown on and it's like, and we become selfish. Well, you didn't do this for me. Well, you didn't do this for me. And it's all about me, mine, and I instead of what can I do to serve you? What can I do to please you? Oh, now I'm meddling. <laughs> So, do you have a second mic, Pastor Mike? 
another mic because I'm going to ask some questions and I know this is being filmed and for those who's watching and I want y'all to come up and help respond. I would pass the mic around to the seats but we don't have a camera person that's moving around so I'm going to have you come and stand and the first question I want you to think about it because we're going to be involved together in this we're going to learn together. What does revival mean to you? What does revival mean to you? Now, I want you to think about that a minute because we hear the word revival. We talk about revival. We say we want revival. We say, oh, it's rain. I smell rain. Oh, it's fire. Oh, it, but no, I want to know what it means to you because that will help make your desire as to why you really want it or not because of what it means to you. Some of us don't really know totally what it means. We only know what somebody's taught, told us. Some people has never experienced a move of God. They have not been in a revival. Some have said, I don't know. I wasn't around during the, the, the healing movement. I wasn't around during the charismatic, the Jesus movement. I wasn't around. I didn't get to go to Brownsville. I didn't get to go to Toronto. I didn't get to be a part of those things. I only hear the stories so what does revival mean to you? I'm going to go ahead and call you first and then some others that, yep, because he, uh, he's hungry about revival. And <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there you go. Well, the revival for me, uh, I think Jesus said it very well in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will, but your will be done. I think if there's one thing that gets in the way of revival in our personal life is we wanting our way or we want revival the way we think it should come. And uh, I really feel personally that uh, the revival that's coming, uh, we've got to lay our wills down and have a hunger for the presence of God. And uh, I think the best prayer to pray is the prayer the Lord taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Why you got that? What does revival mean to you? <laughs> well, revival personally, but uh, my heart cries out not just for revival in me, but revival in the body, the bride, the church. And to me, it's the death and the resurrection of self. Christ resurrected in us. His resurrection manifested his character, his nature, his personality, his love, his joy, his peace, the fruits, the very essence, the very character, the very nature of God manifested in human flesh. And of course, I guess there's a difference between uh, a revival and an awakening. A uh, 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 revival, of course, pertains to the church because the church, uh, we, we sometimes, uh, we die. We die to the reality of God's purpose for our life. Where an awakening is not just the fact that we as believers uh, uh, are quickened by the spirit and recognize our own spiritual condition but it, it hits and, and I've been a lover of, uh, of revival and awakenings uh, throughout history I've studied and I've read many books on this subject preached many sermons on it but an awakening uh, is something like what happened to me when I got saved and it was through my wife's prayers as a young girl I didn't even know it I thought it was the sovereign move of God uh, but on my 19th birthday uh, I was committing suicide. I had a knife to my wrist. I was manic depressant, alcoholic, uh, uh, drugs, uh, you name it, I was into it. When the fear of God hit me, it was a blanket of divine fear hit me. And at that moment, without anybody preaching to me, I knew that I knew that I knew I was going to hell. I deserved hell. I belonged in hell. And I dropped that knife, and I actually had cut myself with it. And, the, and, and when I dropped the knife, I fell to my knees, and I cried out to Jesus Christ. And I became a brand new creation. And when I got up off that floor, and, and this is what I'm talking about when it's a move of God, I took my drugs, my alcohol, my three packs of cigarettes, my chewing tobacco, I took my pornography, I took my rock music, and I threw it all away right then and there. And that was 43 years ago. And I began to preach Jesus Christ. And revival or an awakening, I would say an awakening hit the base I was on. But an awakening is when we awaken to the divine purpose of God for our lives. And we're, we're going to see it. We're going to see it. 
Yes, come on up, hon. Yes. What does revival mean to you? Amen. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Hello. I'm Sherry. Anyway, I wanted, when I was a little girl, Hello. Uh, I accepted Jesus, and, but I didn't understand what it really meant until I was about 13 and went to Bible camp. And talk about revival. Some people there who had never heard of Jesus and, and, and understood what it was all about. It was, a, it was a crying. We were on the floor. We were our face, you know what I mean. We, we just we got so excited about it. And as time goes on and years go on, and we're in school and we're in college and we're here and there and everywhere, and then finally, you know, as years go on and and, and as a missionary, I've, I've I've been in places around the world and and been to a lot of different churches, but I just have to tell you, in 1994, when Pastor Mike hired me as a music teacher here, and I thought, wow, what a church! I came to Pennsylvania to at the seminary, Lutheran seminary. I was raised a Lutheran, but when the fire hit me. I couldn't continue there. We had Vision Christian Bible College here. But the whole greatest thing is that, and then in the meanwhile, I got married, went to a different church. They were Pentecostal, but nothing like this. And now, Pam invited me back to the church here several months ago, and I came back. And you talk about revival. This church has it. And it's like every, every time we're here, we feel it. Monday night, Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And... I tell everybody, and I have to tell you something real quick that just, just touched my heart today. The Lord took me to Hanover. I had a f couple of business things to do. But uh, my car says, God is my pilot. Somebody says, oh, God, you're co-pilot. I said, no, look again. It's my pilot. I really didn't know where all I was going, but I knew I was going someplace. I went to Walmart, and I had forgotten that this is God, too. A week ago, I bought some garlic. I forgot the garlic. I left it there. So I thought, where on earth did it go? I went back to Walmart today. They had it on the list. She says, yeah, I see somebody left garlic. So she gave it to me. In the meanwhile, I'm leaving that little area where she gave, gave it back to me. And here's a young man. He was, he was 18 years old. I spoke to him. And he said that uh, he had just gotten this job a month ago and where he uh, helps people with their electric bills and things like that. And I asked him, I said, have you accepted Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is? He said, well, sort of. I said, D do you know who God is? He said, yeah, I guess so. And so I, I witnessed to him for a while, and I said, would you like to accept Jesus so that you'll know where you're going to go? If one day, I said, you, you could go out the door right now and be hit by a car, and w do you know where you're going? And he smiled at me, and he says, I want to accept Jesus. And so he did. I left there, and I have got to tell you the the next part of this because it's so incredible how God took me then he took me to giant and there was a man in the meat department and I, I I'm not a meat eater but I went there because I was always curious about this thing they have this like a like a lobster thing that little dip so anyway and the Lord told me to go there and and ask if I could have a sample of that and I did I spoke to him and it was like we connected and I, I talked about the Lord, and he said they left their church four years ago because they were having so much trouble. And he said, I've been looking for a church for four years. I said, well, you don't have to look anymore. I said, can you come to, to uh, Gettysburg area? He said, absolutely. I come there all the time. So, Pastor Mike, you're going to have a, a new couple in the church this Sunday. And he is so excited about it. And, and he just cried. I mean, we really... We, we were both weeping there because I knew God sent me there. So revival in our hearts, it, it, it's in our heart. And when we can feel that joy and that love and, and the excitement, you'll probably hear me screaming there back there sometimes, praise God, I just get so excited. I just jump up and down, and I've been, Pastor Mike says, dance. I dance, and, and there were times I sat right in front here when we were having services, when I was teaching, you know, back in 94, 95, and, Pat, and I'd walk in the door sometimes. He said, have some, Sister Sherry. And I would just start laughing and weeping. I was so excited. But one day, right there in a, during the service, he pointed right at me, and he said, have some, Sister Sherry. I fell on the floor. I was out for the whole service. 
Amen. And he could hard, they could hardly even get me up after the service was over. But you want a church that's on fire. This is it. And I'm believing God. And I'm here for a purpose. And you're here for a purpose. And it is time for revival. And we are, all are being revived. And we've got to rejoice and just love on God. And love on word he sends us. Because he'll take you where he wants you. Amen. You may not, it might, might not say God is your pilot on your car. But guess what? He is. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does revival mean to you? Let's try to stay with what revival means. And, and that was good. I don't mind. I'm not pleased. Anything you say is not wrong. That's right. That's right. But I'm trying to get some. Nothing is wrong in what you say. But we're just trying to get some things because some people need to know. Some have never experienced revival. What does revival mean to you? You've heard about it. You've seen it, you've been in it, or you read about it. What does it mean to you? Anyone? Right there. No, on back. No, you. That. Yeah. Come on. What does revival? I want you to be thinking about it, what it means to you. Revival to me. Um and, and God has shown me that revival's coming to our land and to the world. And um, he's blessed me with songs. And one of the songs that, I, that he's given me to write is about that very thing. And it, it's about, you know, America and throughout the world, we've all got our emphasis on earthly riches and gain. And I've been a businessman a good part of my life. And, you know... And I'm younger now, right? I don't say older, I say younger. In Christ, we get younger. You know, he changes, it's all, it's all new. It's revival of our minds and our soul. And so my cry is that the United States stops running after all these uh, false eyes and that we, we learn to love each other again. It's like you, you're out in the highway and people have road rage. You know, they, they yell at each other and scream. You, they don't even know why they're out there. They just go through this, and they get in this rat race. And it's like, you know, revival means to me that everybody needs to come away from the rat race, um, embrace God, and love one another again, and try to uh, just do that, make the renewing of our nation, and then that, that'll spread the other nations. And, yeah, we all have to work. We all have to make a living. But God can, God can provide when you don't think he can provide. He can give blessings where you can't see blessing, and I've received that. You know what I mean? There's been times in my life where I didn't know where next, and, and it's like God delivers it. If you're faithful, and through that, you know, he uses our time and our energies, and that's what revival is going to be. That's what it ma means to me. It starts here. We need to spread it and let it grow. Amen. Amen. Is anyone else? Come on. Dwayne Whitehead, thank you for being here. I would say very quickly, revival is when God steps into a moment or a generation and he impacts a people group and it causes a restoration of passion, pursuit, and love to him. And it's literally a collision of his love hitting the love of a generation and that generation or that people group experiencing him in a way that they never have before, causing a greater pursuit. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? All right. Many. How many of you have ever been in a glory moment or have been in a church service where there's been fire or there's been the presence of God or have you experienced the presence of God? Amen. Part of that is the start of what it, it is. Revival is that presence that you have felt. Revival is that sovereign move of God. It is that anointing. It is. So what are some of the things you learned or received in previous moves of God? What are some of the things you've learned or, or received in previous moves of God? Gifts? Anything else? Joy. Yes. To remain open. Be teachable. 
com compassion for the loss. That's also parts of revival, too. You're answering both, so it's twofold. That's good. Go ahead. I like how you're saying it out. This is kind of what I was wanting, just like a one bit here. What else? Huh? Forgiveness? Say it. Fast? Faithful? Yeah, fat. Faithful, available, teachable. She's saying fat because I said it's okay to be a fat Christian. That means you're faithful, available, teachable. Amen. Amen. What else? Humility. Very good. All of them are good, don't get me wrong, but that's some keys. Humility is, is one of the keys. Humble and pray. He said, if my people call by my name. Humble. So humility. Anything else? I want you to be thinking about these things even before the next time we meet and, and I'm speaking again. I want you to be thinking about what revival means to you. And I want you to be thinking about moves and experiences you've been in because we can read about the book of Acts and the people who were in the book of Acts who received the fire of cloven tongues. Then it was noised abroad. We're up to... The people outside even begin to hear. They begin to realize there's something stirring in the atmosphere. It's an atmosphere change. All of a sudden, the atmosphere around you begins to change. Everything is not the same anymore. On the day of Pentecost, those disciples were not the same anymore. They didn't act the same. They didn't walk the same. They didn't talk the same. They got so on fire for God, so passionate for what they were doing, that even Peter, who used to be boisterous about this or that, uh, should we pay our taxes, Jesus, the people want to know. And he was always kind of like the fisherman who, I know these things and I can do it, boisterous, um, opinionated. Uh, sometimes as a leader, he thought he knew things. And yet, when he experienced the day of Pentecost, when he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and received the Holy Spirit fire, he was changed from the inside out to the point of his passion the day that they were going to kill him for being a Christian and him so in love with Jesus and so passionate about him and the fire of God so strong in him, he said, I'm not worthy to die the way my Jesus died. If you're going to crucify me, crucify me upside down. Now, that takes a lot of love and passion for someone. That takes a lot of, of desire and strength. And that takes the fire of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Because, first of all, he knew what the crucifixion was that Jesus went through because he preached about it over and over again to the people. He told how he was wounded for transgressions. He told how he was beaten, bruised. He told how that the crown of thorns and how they took him through court and they falsely accused him. And he began to know. Oh, everything of how torturous it was what he paid for on Calvary. And yet, knowing all of that, he said, crucify me upside down. When you get on fire for God, when there is a fire revival, when there is a move in you that changes you from the inside out, you are now in this to preach, pray, and die for this gospel. There's a lot of Americans today who would turn on God just like that if they came in and said, make a decision today. Machine guns, are they going to hang your family, or they're going to do this or that? Either deny Christ, or we're going to kill you, or we're going to kill your family. You know what you'd do? Okay, I deny him. A lot of people would turn on Jesus. They would not be passionate and strong for him. But when you get on fire and when you have a passion and you're moved in him because he moves you and because he moves you, it moves you to say, I'll do anything. I don't care. I'll die for you, Lord. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'll be whatever you want me to be. All of a sudden, something is different about you. It's not your own self anymore. It's not your own will, but it's the will of the Father that you say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Too many people today, even in preaching, got to look good. Got to look good to the people. Got to do it. I have many people ask me, even when they have me to come to preach, so now what do you do? 
And I know that sometimes there is an interest. They don't want to just sit and hand their pulpit to anybody. But some of it is they're saying, what's your show? They don't use those words, but they're basically saying, how do you perform? What are the things you can do that really get us all excited? Amen. And there's times I don't even know because I say, when I get there, I really don't know. What I could tell you right now could change when I get there. When I get there, it could be that I'm going to tell you, oh, yeah, there's going to be healings and miracles, and there's going to be a fire. And when I've been going, this has been happening, and this has been happening. Woo, yeah. And he might just say, you just go get a chair and sit in it and look at the people. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine having an evangelist who, who comes? Good, this one's not locked down. I'm going to borrow this a second. And you've already given them a big spiel about what all you're going to do for the Lord, what all you can do for the Lord, and this miracle happened, and that miracle happened, and this happened, and that happened. But if you're following the Holy Spirit and doing what He wants, He says, now when you get there, I just want you to go get in a chair after they introduce you and just look at the people. That wouldn't be very fun. I can tell you right now, it's not even fun for me. That is not, first of all, because I like to talk. <laughs> I, I enjoy the presence. I enjoy sharing about Jesus, and it's hard. So, first of all, just that's hard for me. But people looking and saying thank you. People looking back at you like, uh, what are you going to say? What are you doing? I'm sure the pastor would be like, uh, that's not what you told me on the phone. This is nothing like you said. And I already built you up before the people. Well, you know what? Why don't you build up Jesus? Because what I'll be bringing and what I'll be carrying is his presence. And whatever he wants to do, it will change the atmosphere. So the only thing I can tell you is I'm an atmosphere changer. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I know that when I come, whatever he has to say is what he's going to say to the people. To let them know that either they need to get closer. Or either he's going to heal them. Or he's going to set them free. Or he's asking for repentance. And it's time to get to the altar. But whatever he wants is what he gets. And that's the way it should be. It's the way churches should be. But with so many people are too busy, like Aaron, helping to build the golden calf. Moses up in the presence of God, up in the glory of God. And the people are saying, well, this just in the way everybody else is having church. He's already gone, and he's sitting up there in the glory, and he's having himself a good time. He could even be dead. Who knows? But we know when we were in Egypt, we at least had something. We got to dance before the gods. We got to have parties. We got to celebrate. We got to bow down. And it's kind of boring right now. The only reason it gets boring is because you draw away from God and your relationship gets old in God because I'm going to tell you right now it gets more exciting every day to me it is not boring even tonight when I'm studying revival today before I come over here and I'm saying God I'm going to mess up my makeup I'm weeping and crying because I say God we got to have your presence we got to have a move of God and as I'm studying the things about revival and how the revivals of Hebrides and the Azusa Street and, and I'm just reading what God did and how people was crying out to God and I just wept and I said if that's what it takes I want to do it if that's what it takes God I want to do it if it takes staying on my face like Elisha telling everybody else go look but you come look I don't have time to look for the rain I'm too busy crying out and praying for the rain to come I'm too busy going from city to city and state to state saying Lord send revival we need revival we gotta have revival God it's nothing else I won't be satisfied until there is a fire revival and a mighty move of God. It's where God wants to take the church. He told me once, I will never forget, I've said this before to some, 
and maybe some don't remember it, and it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you that when I was riding in the car and I would cry out, and as I go from cities to states, I do, I pray and I cry out. He, he tells me when we're crossing state lines, honey, wake up. We're passing Ohio. We're passing Pennsylvania. And I put my hand out and I weep and I cry. Send revival, God. We've got to have revival. You know what he said to me one day? He said, do you really want revival? And I said, yes, Lord. He said, then have it. I said, what? He said, you really want revival? I said, yes, Lord. He said, then have it. Just like that? He said, yeah, just like I don't have to wait on the people. I don't have to do like Moses and Joshua and Caleb and wait till they're ready to go in. I mean, I can just have it. He said, yes, I don't hold revival back. It is my presence. It's a sovereign move of God. It is my glory in the place. It is firing people up. It is bringing rain and fire and glory and water and bringing a rising up into more of Him, drawing nigh to God so God draws nigh to you so you know who He is. He don't want you to know about who He is. Oh, yeah, I know who Jesus is. He's the uh, Alpha and Omega. Uh, and I'm not taking that lightly. He's the uh, Jehovah Rapha. He's Jehovah Jireh. We can say all of those things that they've quoted in church. Holies of holies. He is uh, Jesus of Nazareth. He is, and all of these things are awesome because of what he, if you understood. But some people just say them. What I'm trying to say to you is you just say them because you heard somebody say it. But when you begin to come in a relationship with him, when you begin to come into the fire of him, when you begin to come into knowing him, you can say, I know who Jesus is. He said, Peter, who do people say that I am? He said, some say you're the prophet, and some say you're Elisha, Jeremiah. He said, but Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, I want revival because I want relationship with my children. I want revival because God, when it was in the garden with Adam and Eve, that's what it was all created for, was our relationship with him and his relationship with us. It was the ongoing presence, the ongoing glory. And, and yet because man sinned and yet because man was disobedient, then we, we were separated. But Jesus said, I come and I pay the price. So you're not separated. So you can say like Peter, you're Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He said only God could reveal that to you how would you know who all Jesus is if you're not getting to know him and spending time with him I've learned a lot who he is and I can tell you the Nazareth and, and the healings and I can tell you the Alpha and Omega because he he's going to be there at the very end no matter what happens as he said but I can tell it to you in street language he's my doctor Jesus he's my banker Jesus He's my chiropractor, Jesus. He's my family counseling, Jesus. Uh, he's my savior who saved my soul. He's my deliverer when the demons are tormenting me or lying to me and deceiving me and tricking me. He is my deliverer to deliver me out of the snare of the fowler and the noisiness pestilence. And he covers me with his feathers and under his wings shall I trust. He is everything I need and want. And I know everything in this day, in this hour, how I can relate to him. He's my mechanic. He fixed my car. Even my dad knew that. He had a car named Bug-Eyed Josephine. On his way to a meeting, he had a blowout. And the reason he called it Bug-Eyed Josephine because he had to weld parts to it. He, they didn't have any money, and he had to go to the junkyard. And he welded on these headlights that looked like a bug. Big old huge lights. And, and everything he did, he welded parts and put parts together from a junkyard, and they called that car Bug-Eyed Josephine. And on his way to a meeting, he had a blowout. And he got back there and he had no tire, no spare, nothing. He had nothing to even change a tire. He said, God, you called me to preach. And if you want me at that meeting, you're going to have to put air in this tire. And he laid hands on that tire and began to pray. And God put air in that tire. And they never changed that tire to the day they sold the car. God filled it up and he got to the next meeting. Yeah. He's your gas station attendant. 
Jesus. Ever been there where you didn't have enough gas and yet you didn't have any money in your pocket? God, you got to get me there. <laughs> God, you got to get me there. I don't know how I'm going to get there. And all of a sudden, you've driven 50, 80 miles, and you know the thing's on empty, and it's gone below it. And yet your car keeps going as if it's just got more gas than all it's got just a little bit. But that little bit was enough to keep going because God said, I'm taking care of this tank. I know who he is. And a lot of that comes from some of us who stepped into a presence of Almighty God, who stepped into Him quickening, or it could have been when you're at a place and fixing to kill yourself, and He steps into your life. Maybe you were in jail, and He stepped into the jail cell. Maybe you were getting a divorce, and you thought, I don't care about anything anymore, and Jesus shows up. Or maybe you just had a friend invite you to church, and that particular day, they just happened to say the things that went, oh! And it changed you from the inside out. These are experiences that people will have in revival. These are experiences that will change them. These are things that will relate and it will be, an, now let me add to it. All these things that's happened to some of us, when revival comes, there becomes an ease. There becomes an ease. You can just get up and sing, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. People weeping and crying. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You're like, we just sang a little child song. But people are coming as little children weeping. They're coming broken. The brokenness in you that God wants to take and use. And he said, even to Gideon. He said, you know what? He said, we're a mess. You picked the wrong man. We're a mess. He said, I picked brokenness. I picked brokenness. Because when something is broken, the light can shine. Gideon, break those vessels. Let those vessels be broken. The greatest of revival, which one of them said, is brokenness. When the church gets back into brokenness, he said, humble. If my people call by my name, will humble. Humble is brokenness. When we get broken again, we're going to find a move of God. When he begins to break you. Yeah, I went through a spree, and I'll try to close here pretty quick because we're not even going to get to a whole lot of this, and that's okay. But I came to a point that it just seemed like something had happened like I was hitting these walls. It didn't matter what I did. I was just hitting these walls. And I thought, God, and I was doing my job. I was preaching. I was praying for people, and people's getting healed. All kinds of things were happening. And I'm like, God, is something wrong with me? Did I do something? What's going on? I don't understand. And I was at a conference where I was speaking, and the, also the pastor spoke. And that particular day, the pastor got up, and she began to preach on brokenness. And about halfway through her preaching, that's all I did is I wept and I cried and I wept and I cried. I said, God, he said, I've been trying to bring you into a place of brokenness. He said, you're too busy doing my work. He said, some of it ain't even me. It's what you're wanting to do. We can get too busy doing what we think God wants us to do, and it's really us doing. He even got on my dad once. My dad would be there till 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning praying for the sick. He would go do radio broadcast. He would do this. He would do that. He had a church. He had a children's home. He had a school. He had the largest tent in the world. He had the largest magazine printing and, 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 uh, and television. He had all kinds of things going on. And one day he said, Lord, what's wrong in my life? He said, Jack, you're too busy. That even you and I can't talk much anymore. We can get so busy doing what we think is God's stuff. And all he wants is time with you. 
And sometimes he'll say, let me break that vessel again. Because you're so busy, the light can't shine right now. Let me break that vessel, because when I do and the light shines, you're going to shout. He said, Gideon, you're not going to win this war with machine guns. You're not going to win this war with swords and knives. You're not going to win this war with all of what you got of your weapons of warfare. But you're going to win this war from a shout and a light. When I break your vessels and you're going to scatter 300 different men, 100 here, 100 here, and 100 here. But when the vessels are broken and the light shines, begin to shine. Shout! I will take your shout and your light and it will defeat the enemy and the walls will come down. So what will happen in revival? I believe one of the things that will begin to happen in revival is brokenness. Humble yourselves and pray. God said it's time to get back on your face. It's time to cry out. It's time to be that church again. B-U-S-Y, busy, stands for being under Satan's yoke. I don't want to be busy. I told him today, break me again. Break me again. I want revival. Break me again. I need the brokenness. That's why I guess tonight, even in the singing, when I got in here, all I could think about was the things I was studying, the things I thought, how am I going to present? What do you want to present? How do you want? And there was such a brokenness. And I said, God, I want revival. I was praising him. These testimonies, man, these meetings I've gone to, it's like, yes. And that should make you so excited you wouldn't want to cry. That'd make you run around. Yeah, yeah. Jesus did it again. And it is exciting. Don't get me wrong people being saved and set free and I'm, the story's coming in and yeah that make you but today it, even though I wanted to just shout and run all over the, the, the motorhome run all over in here to say look what he did and I could get into such a situation of think yep everything's just great but I couldn't because there was a brokenness and I began to realize and here's the key I'm going to leave you with until God lays it on your heart to cry out for revival, there won't be revival. That brokenness I felt today was Holy Spirit. And when Holy Spirit begins to lay it on your heart to get on your face to cry out and weep, you can get down and try. You can come to a prayer meeting and say, I need to sling snot. I need to do something, God. I'm trying. You can try to work it up. It ain't going to happen. But when Holy Spirit, now I don't mean you can't walk the floor and start declaring because he is for revival and you can do those things, okay? But what I'm saying is when Holy Spirit begins to draw us in as a church in the brokenness of Jesus' heart and we get back on our face crying out to God, there's going to be a move of revival. And I believe he's stirring it. I believe that's why tonight some of us didn't know whether to stand and sing or sit and cry, but we knew he was here, and it's like he's here. He's here. He's here. And there was a sweetness of him, and it could make you want to weep. It could make you want to laugh. It make you want to jump up and down, and it's like that's what he does. He just messes with all your emotions because he's awesome. Stand with me. Brokenness is what I long for. <laughs> Brokenness is what you want from me. Take my heart and use it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my life and change. 